Crypto Hack, a U.S. cybersecurity firm, has identified a North Korean hacking outfit as the hackers behind the latest cryptocurrency attacks in South Korea. This is the same group responsible for the Sony hacks at the end of last year. Joining us right now is Endgame CEO Nate Fick. Nate, good to see you. Thanks so much for weighing in this morning. Hi, Maria. Good morning. So how vulnerable is this cryptocurrency to a hack? Look, we live in a world that's increasingly digitally connected. We're connecting a billion things to the Internet every quarter, including, increasingly now, currencies and cars and other things that we hadn't previously thought of as digital. So there's exposure there, obviously. And when you talk about war with a place like North Korea and the United States, you're talking about a potential war between a strong country and a weak country. And the, the, the cyber capabilities can be weapons of the weak. They're cheap and easy to develop. Uh, here's my biggest issue. It's Kevin Kelly. I, I, I see all these things coming out of North Korea, and I'm like, how is a regime like this able to get do anything possible, such as come up with the wanna cry, such as develop nuclear weapons? And the only thing coming into my head is that they're enabled by China. I see, you know, North Korea as a proxy for China to develop things, figure out how they can actually come up with attacks, they can place blame. You know, what is your take on that? That North Korea is being enabled by China, especially in the cybersecurity realm because we're seeing these attacks happen but the only way North Korea gets internet is through China well look one of the realities of cybersecurity is that defense is really hard but attacking is pretty easy and think about the attacks even here in the United States that have been launched by you know a kid in his parents basement so the reality is the the barriers to entry to this kind of high-end cyber capability are falling and it's likely that North Korea is getting outside help, but it's also not beyond the realm of possibility that a handful of people relatively well equipped can do this themselves. Nate, this is John Layfield. Uh, this appears to be their only option, right? I mean, they don't have the gas, literally the gasoline yeah. to invade South Korea. They don't have any money. So their only option out there is to either be a cyber terrorist or develop nuclear weapons. Isn't that right? This is a matter just of self-survival. There's a great book about the Vietnam War called The War of the Flea that makes this point that in asymmetrical conflicts, conflicts between the strong and the weak, these are the sorts of things the weak adversary does. Cybersecurity, cyber capabilities are cheap and easy to develop. So, yes, I agree with you. You go to the low end of the spectrum and develop these kinds of capabilities, or you go to the high end of the spectrum, the nuclear end, to try to deter the United States. Well, and this is Carrie Sheffield. So, there was elections in South Korea last year, and word on the street is that the new leader they have there, he's not as pro-Western as some of his predecessors. What's your assessment of that? Um, there's even talk that he wants to reopen the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which by my mind would allow millions of dollars to flow into North Korea, to the point that was said earlier, that would allow the North Koreans to have access to more capital, which means they could do more damage. I think there's a reality that the South Koreans have to live next door to North Korea and are probably going to be uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, potentially pragmatic or even accommodationist than the United States can be across the Pacific Ocean. Look at the talks recently. Uh, look at the, the inclusion of North Korean athletes in the Olympics. Uh, you know, th this is uh, it's, it's a matter of geography and proximity. Nate, let me ask you about the hacks hitting corporate America. I mean, Intel revealed a flaw in, it, uh, a flaw rather in its security, allows hackers to compromise a laptop in, in literally seconds. Then you had last year's uh, incident, Yahoo, revealing the cyber attacks affected all 3 billion users. All 3 billion users and Equifax, uh, the hack, compromised 145 and a half million Americans. You have a recent op-ed in the New York Times, and you're asking who should be held accountable for the complex cyber attacks. Is this a federal? or a corporate issue? Who, at the end of the yeah. day, who's responsible or who should be accountable for the fix? I, I think it's a little bit of both. On, on the one hand, with the companies themselves, we're not seeing uh, the kind of accountability in the market that you would expect to see if investors and consumers were taking this seriously and recognized that all of their personal data and so much of their potential livelihood is at stake. Uh, on the government side, though, uh, we really see a vacuum of government policy here, specifically with respect to deterrence. Imagine if American ships were sailing out of Rotterdam to New York and being attacked by foreign navies, or if American airlines uh, were at risk of being shot down by foreign MiGs. We'd be dealing with this in a different way, but that's exactly what's happening in the cyber domain, and we don't have the government policies informational, economic, diplomatic, or if necessary, military to deter it. So that's bigger government. That's a, a, a bigger government to, to, to handle this. Is that I don't what, think that's what you want? I don't, 
No, I don't think it's bigger. Look, I, I fought in Afghanistan and Iraq after 9-11. We didn't send citizens with pitchforks to Afghanistan. Mm. We had a military response to defeat and dissuade our adversaries, and we need the same thing in the cyber domain. Nate, it's why I, government exists. Nate, we, we talk about this, uh, the, the specter situation that's happening with Intel. You know, how do we pre prevent these things going into the future. I mean, you, you know, we're, we're talking on a business show. It affects stocks like AMD, Intel, you name it. I, as an investor myself, I'm trying to, how do I, how do I protect myself against this? And how, how, do, how do these companies protect themselves? Yeah, well, the, the, look, the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities are a whole new breed here, right? For the first time, really, we're talking about the firmware. We're talking about the CPU. And it, it appears that there are some intermediate things we can do to limit the exposure, but ultimately you're talking about a, a supply chain refresh uh, and, and ultimately replacing all of those chips over time. Nice. Um, that, that's a unique thing. Most of the vulnerabilities and most of the breaches that we've encountered over the last several years, Yahoo and Equifax and others, are software problems that can be more rapidly remediated. So it's simple table stakes like uh, applying your patches, training Nate, your people, yeah. deploying Nate, technology. Nate, yeah. are we losing this war? I mean, it certainly looks like from the outside uh, and that we are. I mean, Google has 50 of the top AI, 100 scientists in the world, a private company. China says they're going to be the leader in AI in 2020. It seems like we are losing this war. Is that you think that's right? So I think we're currently losing the war, and I'll give you the numbers to back it up. Three numbers. $75 billion spent a year on cybersecurity, and yet 90% plus of large enterprises breached. And once the bad wow. guys are in, it takes an average of three months to find them. So, yes, we're losing the war. Well, and how do you even do that internally when you have the enemy within people like Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, et cetera, who are, you know, supposed to be the people protecting us, and then you have them doing traitorous behavior? How can you even protect against that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, vetting, vetting employees and internal security is a whole separate issue and a good one to raise. And our security clearance process, you know, inside the government and inside government contractors is another whole issue. Uh, I, think, I think, you know, when you boil it down in, in cybersecurity, though, uh, we need to build better software. We have to roll cybersecurity into the overall enterprise risk management framework and enterprises, uh, and we need the government to make sure deterrence works in the cyber domain. All right, we will leave it there. Nate, great insights from you. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. Thank Nate you. Nate Fick there.